Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. And I am joined this evening by H.G. Tudor. And we have spoken with him on two prior occasions. And I will link those videos down below if anybody would like to go back and get an incredible refresher on the information that he has shared. But H.G., can you take a moment and just introduce yourself to my audience, please? Certainly. Uh, thank you for welcoming me back, Faye. My name is H.G. Tudor. That's not my real name. It's a pseudonym. I'm a diagnosed narcissistic psychopath that has many fingers in many pies around the world, but the one that Faye knows me for and for many people on the internet know me for is for providing unrivaled content, enabling people to understand narcissism, that I allow you to come into my world to tell you how my mind works, how I see the world and how others of my kind think, function and operate. So not only is it a fascinating subject of itself, it provides very practical information to people to aid their understanding, which is all part of me extending my legacy. So I've written over 50 books on the subject. I've created thousands of videos and blog articles about the topic, which can be found on my YouTube channel, which is HG Tudor, knowing the narcissist, the ultra, and on my blog, narc site, N A R C S I T E dot com. So there's a wealth of material there, along with the Knowledge Vault, which contains paid for material as well. So I'm looking forward to sharing more of my insights today. Thank you. And I will be linking uh, your website and all of your um, social media accounts down below as well for anybody that does want to check them out. Um, I'm curious if you feel uh, how you feel about sharing your how you came to be so incredibly knowledgeable about the subject of narcissism. Well, I'm entirely comfortable with sharing my thoughts on that. The information that I'm able to provide arises, say, as a consequence of I'm a very intelligent man, which provides me with insight through that. It's also the case that my uh, narcissism has developed in a way, as it does for a limited number of people, that I'm actually granted insight as to what I am. Most narcissists are unaware that there are some that know what they are, and understand what that means and I'm one of those and it's just the way that my narcissism has developed to allow me that awareness it's part of the evolution I suppose it's akin why is it that certain people become better athletes than others there's something intrinsic in the way that they have developed of course there's training and diet and so forth but at the end of the day there are certain people who are superior footballers, for instance, to somebody else. They just have that innate talent. And I suppose one way of describing it is I have an innate talent for understanding what I am. Added to that, of course, is the fact that I've received observations and insight from medical professionals that I've interacted with throughout my life. And I have spent a lot of time around my kind. They are in my family. I have some in my friendship groups. I've worked with and against many of my kind. And I have a huge thirst for knowledge. I'm an inquisitive fellow. And therefore, I've observed my kind at play, at rest, at work, etc. And I assimilate all of that information. And so I then reflect on that information that I've acquired. And that enabled me to disseminate it to people through the works that I mentioned in my opening introduction. So how many years ago did you receive your diagnosis as a narcissistic psychopath? It was in my 20s when I received that diagnosis. Prior to that, I had always had an understanding that I was different to other people. As for as far back as I can remember, I have behaved differently to people. I have asked different questions. I have... Uh, functioned in a separate way, for instance, to uh, the way that my brother and sister did. That was the earliest where I realised that there was a difference, which didn't concern me in the slightest. And as time went on, I could see that I responded differently to scenarios compared to other people, and I had a different outlook on the world to other people. I also saw, for instance, because my mother is a narcissist, that there were 
things that she did that I also did and saw the link between those two. And as I got older, a former girlfriend told me that she believed that I was both narcissist and psychopath. And as I mentioned many times before, I said, oh, that's very interesting. Tell me more because there's no subject that I'm more interested in than myself. And so I listened. And some of the points that she made made perfect sense to me. Naturally, I didn't give her the admission that she was seeking. I simply said, well, that's all very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I must now be about other matters and away I went. And I went and did some reading and I thought, aha. Yeah, I thought that was the case. And then I basically had labels for what I was. And as a consequence of my interaction with medical professionals later on, for reasons which I've gone into many times, and I don't need to go into again, they came up with a formal diagnosis, and that was in my 20s. So I'm curious, uh, now that you had this, this diagnosis and you, under, you came to be a self-aware uh, so-called narcissist, mm -hmm. If you can share how you know so much about empaths and how your knowledge of empaths has changed, perhaps, since becoming so-called self-aware. Go and speak to a hunter and ask them about the elk or the moose or a fisherman about the uh, perch or the cod or the salmon that he catches. And he'll undoubtedly be able to tell you the best spots to find those prey. He'll be able to tell you the most effective way of catching them. He'll tell you when it's the best season to do so. He'll tell you about the things that make it easier to catch them, perhaps as particular foods that they're attracted to. They'll tell you about how you need to mask your smell and you must ensure that you stand downwind They'll tell you about how you should approach the act of catching this individual. They'll understand the habitat of the creature and so on and so forth. Why? Because by understanding all of that, it makes them a much more effective hunter. And it's exactly the same for me. The reason that I know so much about empaths is that they are my prey. And in order to be an effective hunter and predator, one must ensure that you understand your prey inside out. To fail to do so is remiss accordingly as part of where i observed as i mentioned earlier on Faye, observing those of my kind and the way that they behaved i also observed empaths and how they behave what they have done who that how they function what their weaknesses are what their dynamic is with people and i absorbed all of that and of course i've had many victims who are empaths and each one is treated akin to putting them under the microscope. How do they respond to this? How do they respond to that? And one fine tunes one's interactions with them. And therefore I build up a huge bank of knowledge about my prey. So like the hunter, like the fisherman, they are my subject matter alongside the narcissists. And as a consequence of keen observance. So I watch, I listen, I absorb, and I create this huge bank of knowledge about them. So that's where the knowledge comes from. It's a process of years of involvement with these individuals, which is done in order to make me more effective at what I am. In terms of what I thought about them, in terms of awareness, well, in a sense, I've always been aware that I've been different when I had the formal confirmation as to what I am, that didn't really make any difference about how I saw empaths. I already saw them in a particular view prior to that and being confirmed as to what I was, that didn't alter that viewpoint. That's kind of chilling that you refer to it as hunting, but I also feel like it's rather apropos because for somebody that has been on the other receiving end of it, when you come to understand that you are actually involved with a narcissist, it can feel rather akin to being hunted. So mm -hmm. I appreciate your candor in actually answering it that way. Um, Precisely. Can you, thank you for that. Can you also share how you experience personally 
for yourself, your interaction with an empath, and how that may differ from how you're going to be interacting or the experience that you have interacting with a so-called normal. The empath has an addiction to the narcissist, which makes them far more susceptible to being ensnared and kept ensnared compared to a normal. Narcissists pursue either consciously or subconsciously the prime aims, which is a person must be controlled. They must provide fuel, character traits and residual benefits. Those four things can be provided by anybody that has a functioning heartbeat. So another narcissist can provide me with fuel. A normal can give me character traits. A narcissistic person who isn't a narcissist could provide me with some form of residual benefit. So all of the classifications of individuals that I use in this topic, namely empath, normal, narcissistic, and narcissist, can provide those prime aims. But it's a little bit like going to the supermarket and you're being, uh, you have in front of you different types of orange. Some are larger and sweeter, some are smaller and more bitter, some present better value for money. And ultimately, the personal preference is one which suits your needs the best. So if you decide, well, I need an orange which is large, so I'm going to get lots of juice out of it that is sweet tasting and doesn't cost me a lot of money, that is the type of orange that you're always going to go for. So similarly, for me, I need somebody that's easy to control, that provides lots of fuel and has the capacity for character traits and residual benefits. And the classification of individual which matches that uh, set of criteria is the empath. So the empath, because of their addiction, experiences what is called emotional thinking. Doesn't mean that they're hysterical. It simply means that logic goes out of the window and they, in a way, behave as if they are drunk, that their normal um, alerts and warning systems are temporarily taken offline as a consequence of this emotional thinking, that they don't see the red flags or where they do, they don't act upon them. And this means that those individuals become far easier to draw in. At the end of the day, although I'm a superior type of narcissist, I still want to be able to get what I want swiftly, easily, and with a minimum of expenditure because then that leaves me with time, asset and resource to do other things and to ensnare other people. And it is a common theme amongst all narcissists that our narcissism effectively operates on an economy setting. So if you wanted a pint of milk, you could either go to the convenience store 500 yards from your apartment, or instead you could take a taxi to the airport get on a plane, fly to the United Kingdom, get a taxi at the other end, go to Waitrose, pick up a pint of milk from there and then do the journey in reverse. Which one are you going to do? You're going to go to the convenience store. So similarly, the narcissist wants the individual that's easiest to control that will provide the most fuel, character traits and residual benefits. Now, there might be a narcissist that will fountain with fuel because they have a low threshold on their ignited fury. So they will get angry very quickly So lots of delicious fuel there. They might have some fairly decent character traits. For instance, they might be quite a talented individual who is well-known, and there may be residual benefits. They're wealthy, they're well-connected, but they're problematic in terms of control. So a narcissist might have an early involvement with this individual, but it will likely go wrong very quickly. Therefore, they are not the ideal target, whereas the empath, is the ideal target because that presence of the addiction and emotional thinking locks the empath into the dance the symbiotic relationship with the narcissist and thereafter they find it difficult not impossible of course but difficult to escape or even if they do to stay escaped and that's why we choose empaths and similarly why i do So I think you actually answered the next question I was going to ask, which is why empaths Mm -hmm. are the preferred partner for a narcissist. But it sounds Mm -hmm. like it is actually the emotional thinking that you had mentioned. So can you speak a little bit more about the emotional thinking? 
Yes. <clears throat> so if you were to say to somebody as a hypothetical case, so you, you sit down with them and you say, imagine if you met somebody and they told you that you're the most beautiful woman in the world, that you've never met anybody like you, that I've fallen in love with you on the second date. I want to marry you and have children. I want to spend all of my time with you. I'm going to send you lots of messages. I'm going to turn up at your front door reciting poetry uninvited and give you lots of gifts. What would you think? That person would likely think, ooh, that's a bit creepy. It's a bit over the top. It sounds nice, but it's a bit full on, actually. So I'd be a little bit wary. There, they're using logic. But that very same person, if they were experiencing the things that I de described in an actual relationship, they lap it up. What's the difference? Well, in the first scenario, they're just sat with me having a cup of tea and we're talking about a hypothetical situation, i.e. they're not actually experiencing it. So their emotional thinking isn't operating at full throttle. So they're able to see all of the things that I've described as red flags. They have that clarity of vision at that moment. Yet when they start to become involved with that narcissist, their emotional thinking rises. Because whenever you have an interaction with a narcissist, whether it's doing things with the narcissist, physically being together, communicating, doing things for that narcissist or in relation to that narcissist, for instance, snooping on them on social media, talking about them with other people and thinking about them, those are all interactions which start to increase your emotional thinking. And as your emotional thinking climbs, you lose insight. You lose the ability to hold on to logic. And therefore, what then happens is that that clarity that I spoke about, namely, you can see that somebody who's sending you a lot of messages and monopolizing your time and says they love you on the second date as being full on over the top and somewhat creepy, you lose sight of that. Your emotional thinking tells you, wow, you've met the man or woman of your dreams. They love you after two dates. That's fantastic. It's great that somebody feels that way about you. Oh, another gift. He's really into me. That's marvelous. Oh, he's turned up at my door reciting poetry. That's so sweet, so romantic. And all of those things in the clear light of day, when it's a hypothesis, you fail to recognize all of those red flags. So emotional thinking prevents the victim from seeing clearly what they are dealing with. Emotional thinking wants to keep the victim locked into the engagement with the narcissist to feed the addiction. So ad the addiction creates this emotional thinking almost as a con artist, which is whispering in the ear of the victim, I need you to stay with this narcissist. So I'm going to blind you to these red flags. And I'm going to make you think that they're all really wonderful things. And then when this person starts abusing you, I'm not going to allow you to go, I'm being abused. Goodbye. I'm leaving. I'm going to make you think, oh, what have I done wrong? Everything was wonderful before. I must have done something wrong. What can I do to make it right? Oh, our relationship is having problems. Well, I love this person and they love me, so we're not going to walk away from it. Let's work through this and see what we can do. I'm going to love them even harder to try and resolve all of this. Maybe they're having difficulties because they're tired or they're stressed from work. And it prevents them from seeing often that they're being abused. Or even if they recognize that, it prevents them from acting upon it. So emotional thinking is a very powerful and insidious weakness that empathic people experience. And invariably, it's that which can prove more difficult to deal with than the actual narcissist themselves. Because of course, there are instances where the narcissist kicks you to the curb, runs off with somebody else, and isn't interested in you, and largely leaves you alone. And yet you're there obsessing, why have they left me? Why are they with this person? Why did it go wrong? I want them back. What if that person gets the best of them? I, I know that he was horrible to me, but I think it was just a temporary thing. And that it, you find yourself dwelling on all of those thoughts and others. And even though you're no longer in the relationship with the narcissist, it feels like you are because you continue to think about the narcissist on a regular basis. You get upset and angry and frustrated. 
you talk to your friends and family who are no doubt glazing over at yet another anecdote in relation to this person's behavior, which they've heard 10 times before. But you almost develop this obsession driven by emotional thinking. And that's one of the most important things that an empathic victim of a narcissist needs to be able to conquer. And for us, it's the most important facet of the dynamic, which enables us to ensnare empaths and keep them in place. So what would you say is an essential thing that an empath can do to conquer, as you so eloquently put it, their emotional thinking? Is it one thing? Is it many things? Is it a set number of things to do in a certain particular order? What would you recommend? First of all, you need to know what it is that you're dealing with. So you need that confirmation that, for instance, you are dealing with a narcissist. Because so many people don't realize that's the case. Regularly, I see it and you will see it in the news about another person who's been subjected to coercive control. A person who, only yesterday I created a video about an Irish lady whose partner, an Irish police officer, had basically said to her, while she was giving birth, I've only come here to watch you bleed to death. And the midwife overheard this and sent him out of the delivery room. So that was fortunate the midwife heard that. And there was a whole article about his behaviours, which I broke down vis-a-vis -vis the, the narcissistic dynamic to help people understand a real-life example. Narcissism wasn't mentioned at all. And this happens time and time again, that narcissism is not picked up on. So you need to understand that's what you're dealing with, because with that, as you know, comes a wealth of different understanding about what drives this person, why they think the way that they do, why they behave the way that they do, the distortion field through which they see the world. And anybody who has immersed themselves in my work and narcissism generally knows it's a fascinating and huge topic. And it really is like going down the rabbit hole in terms of, gosh, I never realized there was this whole thing in relation to this particular type of behavior. I just thought I was being abused or he was a drunkard or she was high maintenance, for instance. So the first thing is you need to understand what it is that you're dealing with and what that means. And naturally accessing my work in relation to gaining all of that understanding will provide you with clarity. You then need to implement the first golden rule of freedom, which is once you know, you go, you get out and you stay out. The principle of go so, as I've developed. And that means implementing a total no contact regime. And if you do that, over time, your emotional thinking will drop down to the lowest level. Every single time you have an interaction with a narcissist, your emotional thinking will go back up. So I often talk about imagining a huge bathtub with five taps on it. And those five taps represent the arenas of interaction. And when you're with the narcissist, all of those five taps are on. They're flowing with emotional thinking, filling up that bathtub. And then you get realization as to what you're dealing with. So you pull out the plug, but you've got a huge bathtub that needs to drain. And that plug hole's not very big. But if those taps are still on, it's never going to drain away. So you need to be able to, one, know what you're dealing with to pull out the plug, and then you need to turn those taps off. Now, what can happen is some people turn the tap down, but not off. They might turn it off and then it comes back on again. Thus, that level of emotional thinking, if you turned all of those taps off with a total no contact regime and allowed that bathtub to drain, it takes approximately five to six months for your emotional thinking to get down to the lowest level that it needs to. Of course, most people aren't able to achieve such a guillotine uh, approach to this. And some of the taps stay on, some are off, they keep going on and off, the flow differs. And therefore, that's why it can take longer. In order to conquer that emotional thinking, you must know what you're dealing with, and then you must implement a total no contact regime and stick to it and bring it down. And it means anything that's telling you to interact with the narcissist, for instance, I feel a compulsion 
to talk to my friend about him because it's the narcissist's birthday. That's emotional thinking, trying to make you turn that tap back on or open it up wider. You must resist it. If you think, well, I'm feeling better about myself, I'm just going to have a little mooch around on the internet to see what he's up to, find out if there's trouble in paradise in his new relationship. That's emotional thinking. It's causing you to try and have an interaction. If you think that low down P of S, I'm going to go and give her a, the uh, benefit of my thoughts about her. I'm going to go and tell her that I know she's a narcissist. So I'm going to go around there full of piss and vinegar and hammer on the door. That is your emotional thinking, corrupting your trait, your narcissistic trait of anger to cause you to go around and confront. What do you do? You have just entered an arena of interaction. You have increased your emotional thinking again. And so anything, this is in a way a litmus test, anything that causes you to consider interacting with the narcissist can only be emotional thinking because logic says this, stay away from the narcissist. You don't need to be having any involvement. The only narcissist you should ever have any involvement with is me because I'm the voice of the logic and the clarity that you require. So you brought up a, a lot of really interesting points that I kind of want to touch on, which is, um, I know that you have uh, books on this subject, so I'm not sure how mm -hmm. much you feel uh, comfortable sharing, but what, what would you say to people that don't have the exact luxury of uh, go so getting out and staying out? If, for example, they are co-parenting with a narcissist. So what kind of um, no contact regime can they implement in that case? Or how can they modify that to suit their needs if they have to have some sort of ongoing contact with the narcissist in their life? Many people think that they can't implement a total no contact regime. And actually they can. It may require effort and sacrifice, but if you're overweight and you need to lose weight, you're going to have to sacrifice. Pizza and ice cream and donuts are off the menu, because if they're not, you're not going to lose any weight, or you'll only lose it slowly. It's often the case that many people are impacted by that emotional thinking at the very outset, so that they think, I can't do a total no-contact regime because... And actually, many of the reasons they put forward are not particularly good ones. They're honest reasons. It's not like they're lying about it. But the fact is, uh, you come to me and tell me why you can't, and I'll tell you how you can. You might, often you might not like what I've got to say because it will involve some sacrifice and some hard work. But that's often what prevents people. Because at the end of the day, unless you are chained to a radiator in the basement of the narcissist's house, you have the capacity to get away from them. I accept that in certain instances it may not be easy, but you still have the capacity to do so. There are very few legitimate, legitimate exceptions to the no-contact regime. And one, which you've touched upon, is where you're co-parenting with a narcissist and a court has ordered that you must have some form of interaction with that narcissist. Naturally, you can't disobey the court order. You might try and go back and get it changed. So that's an option for heading towards a go-so scenario. But some people think that they can't do a total no-contact regime when they're co-parenting, and you can. Now, as I mentioned, if that court order says you must speak to or you must have a telephone number that's made available to the narcissist so they can communicate with you about the children, then you can't do total no contact and there's a legitimate exception. But that isn't always the case. And there are many instances where, and I set all of this out in my How to Co-Parent with a Narcissist Assistance Package, I detail practical ways that you can actually do total no contact or almost total no contact even though you're co-parenting. And there's lots of practical tips in there that many people might not have been aware of or didn't think they could implement, which helps them get to that position. The starting point should always be, I must achieve total no contact, because if you do that, you're not going to be abused any longer. 
you're going to get your emotional thinking down faster. So that's the holy grail. That's what you must aim for. Not, oh, well, you know, I'll kind of do low contact or pop. No, the starting point should be strive for the ultimate outcome. And you'll be surprised that it's more achievable than you may think. You see, sometimes people have instances such as, I don't want to leave the house. You know, we've got a lovely house. Well, if you think that having a lovely house is more important than your sanity and well-being, you might want to have another look at your priorities. If, for instance, somebody says, well, you know, I haven't got anywhere to go. Of course, it's advantageous to have somewhere to go to. But have you really made the effort to find out? And in some instances where you're particularly in danger, you get out with the clothes on your back and you go and stay in a hotel or you sofa surf or hell, you go and stay in a tent or whatever. Is it fair that you have to leave your house behind? No, it's not. But this isn't about fairness. It's about effectiveness. It's about doing what's needed to ensure. Because if you remain in that house with the narcissist because you think, I don't want to give up the house, you're going to be tormented. You're going to continue to be abused. You're putting yourself in the firing line. So you have in the past mentioned that gray rock, which is kind of held to be like the gold standard of how an empath can, especially if they have to co-parent, let's say, for example, um, that's kind of like held as the gold standard of how the empath can safely, one could say, interact with a narcissist. However, I have heard you say that it is not effective in any means. So can you speak a little bit more about that? Certainly, Faye. Grey rock is one of those things which is almost an excuse. It gives people an excuse to have some form of interaction. So rather than choose the what ostensibly might be a harder option, but the more effective one of total no contact, their emotional thinking tells them, oh, I can't do that. So I'll do grey rock instead. But grey rock doesn't work. Here's why. The idea is that you stay away from us. If you do grey rock, you're having some form of interaction with us. All right. It may not be as much as it once was. So that is an improvement. But you're still having an interaction with us, which means we can still abuse you. So you're not getting away from the problem. Secondly, the idea with Grey Rock is not to provide much of a reaction to the narcissist, because, as you know from my work, we require fuel, which is basically your emotional response provoked by us. The fact is, you provide fuel in lots of different ways. And because you're not made out of stone, even if you decide, well, I'm not going to reply to the narcissist, you can't help but respond through your body language, your facial expression, the look in your eyes, for instance, which gives us fuel. So we say something particularly cutting and nasty to you. Once upon a time, you would go, why are you being horrible to me? That's an awful thing to say. Why are you doing this? Now you've learned, I'm not going to say that. But believe me, your eyes will show the hurt. You can't control that. Your facial expression will give you away. You might shrink away from the narcissist with your body language. You've just given us fuel, and that's what we want. So you're not actually curing the problem. Furthermore, it goes back to the point that I mentioned earlier on about emotional thinking. You're still interacting with the narcissist, which means you're going to increase your emotional thinking and keep it, too high, keep it at a too high a level. So grey rock, although it's better than nothing, admittedly, it's not that much better because the point of no contact is remove yourself from the abuse. Grey rock doesn't do that. Don't provide fuel to the narcissist. Grey rock doesn't do that. Get your emotional thinking down. Grey rock doesn't do that reduce the likelihood of being hoovered by staying off the narcissist's radar. Grey rock doesn't do that. In the scheme of things, it, as I say, it's better than nothing, but it's not that much better. And instead of using that as an excuse, and what happens is, because you're still having those ongoing interactions and your emotional thinking is high, eventually your dedication to this grey rock regime falls to one side because you get sucked back in that irrepressible force of the emotional thinking takes over and your resolve to maintain grey rock falls by the wayside. 
Whereas you stand a much better chance of keeping a total no contact regime in place because your emotional thinking is falling rather than staying at the same level or increasing as it would do under Greyrock. So I also just want to mention for anyone who has is not familiar with this term gray rock, it's essentially where the victim of the narcissist is to make themselves as interesting as a gray rock, which is not very interesting at all. It's single answers. It's just kind of like how you would maybe refer to this one's wife as beige, making yourself mm -hmm. beige. No, no flavor, no color, no nothing. But um HG has done a fantastic job of explaining why that does not, in fact, actually work. Now, to go back a moment ago, you had mentioned, and you have this really great series that you do on an ongoing basis, as you had mentioned, where you'll kind of um, go to stories that are playing out in the world. It could even be somebody sharing their own experience being for, you know, on a dating site or um stories that are going to be in publications where narcissism is not mentioned, but you can view it through the lens and understand it as narcissism. And I think probably a lot of your tutorites as well um, have gotten to that point as well. But I'm wondering, why do you think there is so much of a lack of awareness that it is, in fact, narcissism? The awareness is increasing. If you were to compare, for instance, the number of channels on YouTube talking about narcissism now to 20 years ago, well, YouTube... I think just about existed then, didn't it? Or uh, across the internet as a whole, there's a great proliferation of that information compared to how it was. But when you then compare that as against general relationship advice, you will see time and time again that narcissism isn't mentioned. I think part of the difficulty that arises relates to the fact that there is a reluctance among certain people to use the word, even if they actually do know about it. So whilst I appreciate there are certain ethical considerations that certain practitioners operate under, which means they can't mention it or ought not to mention it where they haven't actually done an actual one-on-one -on -one diagnosis, one understands that. So that's part of the issue, but it's only a small part of it. The larger part of it is, is that simply the individuals who are at the coal face of relationships, psychotherapists, agony aunts, relationship gurus, whatever you want to describe them as, most of them have not learned about narcissism or the ones that have, their understanding of it tends to be fairly shallow. Now, of course, given where you're working in the psychological field, given the wide range of psychological issues that human beings have, Narcissism is but one part of it. So it's understandable that general practitioners only know a little bit about it and they aren't specialists. But given the fact that, for instance, these agony aunts and relationship gurus and so forth, one of the things that they deal with frequently is a difficult relationship, a problematic relationship, an abusive relationship. Yes, they occasionally might get correspondence from a man who says, I'm no longer able to get an erection and it's impacting on my sex life. So go and buy some Viagra, that'll sort you out, matey boy. So that they have that side of things they can deal with. A lot of the correspondence that comes in, either genuine or generated by the relationship guru as a talking point, revolves around abusive relationships. But they just don't know about narcissism in the first place to be able to talk about it because where they've had a formal education with regards to their field, narcissism either isn't on the curriculum or is, a, is two hours on a wet Tuesday afternoon. And with many of these individuals, they're time served. So, you know, they you often get that sort of um, matriarchal character, you know, in the 60s or, or so, who's done a bit of living and, you know, been around a few relationships and so forth, and may have volunteered at a mediation service. And so they're a time served individual. They've had no formal training or exposure to narcissism. Indeed, some of these people are, have actually experienced it themselves, but didn't even realize it. So it comes down to a failure of education or an absence of education for all of these practitioners. 
So what then happens is, how can they talk about narcissism if one, they don't know about it, or two, the little that they do know about it, they're not able to apply properly. And that's the difficulty, that out there in the sphere of relationship advice and the examination of relationships and the way that they function, too few people actually know about narcissism. And it's invariably people who've on the receiving end of it, who then go to Mr. Internet and go and visit Google and put in, why does he not respond to my text messages? Or why does she blow hot and cold? And immediately they get these answers and they find themselves in this world of narcissism. Oh, right. Okay. So that's what it is. And they come across my work or provided by other individuals and they drink deep at the well of knowledge. And so they become greater experts in it than these so-called advisors, because the advisors simply haven't been exposed to the knowledge of what it is. Can you also speak to why there is or why there might appear to be a overproliferation of um, what some might consider to be narcissistic misinformation that is available mm. on the web? Yes, this is a, a habitual bugbear of mine, so I'm rather pleased that you've touched on it. Today. The first is there are there are numerous people that have the best of intentions to help other individuals. Often, these are people who are genuine victims of narcissists. So what they do is they talk about what happened to them and they will use some of their learning from other sources and mix that all together and create videos, create a website. Now, what that does is it will provide validation to people. Oh, I went through that too. Okay, that's all well and good. But invariably, that individual, it's problematic for the following reasons. One, they often regurgitate existing misunderstandings about narcissism. Two, they are not bringing anything new to the party. They're telling you things which are already out there, correct or not. And it's just another experience of a victim of which there are millions upon millions floating around. Thirdly, they don't have any particular insight to add to the situation. Fourthly, it's actually not that good for them as a person to do it, because what are they doing? They may well be talking about their narcissist that they were involved in. That's a breach of the no contact regime. And so, and they might be doing it at an early stage where they're still fairly raw about it. So you have those well-intentioned individuals, but they're not providing you with the quality of information that's necessary there's gaps, there's misunderstandings. Then you have your professional practitioners. They obviously know something of the subject. They may well have studied the subject. There are two, possibly three problems here. The first is they often tend to talk in quite esoteric tones, which means that the people that receive the information don't really understand what's being said, not because they're stupid. It's just that they're often using scientific or psychological terms which they struggle to marry to their experience. Secondly, it may well be that there's gaps in the knowledge of that professional practitioner also. Thirdly, many of them actually haven't experienced it themselves. And it's a frequent complaint of individuals that they went to see somebody who apparently specialized in narcissism, but it became apparent that they never actually experienced it and they just read about it. And that came through in the information they were providing. The third group, and this is ostensibly the most dangerous group, are the unaware narcissists, typically mid-range by my classification, who think that they're victims. If you think about it, if you're the victim of a narcissist, your priority ought to be, I get away from the narcissist and I heal, I get better, I improve everything that went wrong when I was in a relationship with this person. To do that, I can do so privately. I can access information, I can see a therapist, I can talk to some friends to get that support, whether it's a shoulder to cry on in the early stages or helping them move, whatever it is. What you don't need to do is immediately go to the internet and scream to the world, I've been mauled by a narcissist. And yet what you see are these individuals whose first reaction is not only to say that's what's happened to them, but to provide you with an ongoing commentary 
about what's going on and a spat and so on and so forth. And accordingly, what happens is these unaware narcissists don't understand the topic. How can they? They're unaware and they think they're a victim. And what they end up doing is using information from elsewhere and regurgitating it, thus the same problem as I mentioned in the first group, propagating certain myths, having certain gaps in the knowledge, but then creating fresh problems or building on an existing ones by portraying the narcissist in a particular way, which isn't accurate. That unaware narcissist believes themselves to be a victim. So their narcissism tells them that the narcissist in their world, who isn't actually one, is hell-bent on destroying them, that is haranguing them each and every day. There is a revision of history caused by their own narcissism to control their audience by saying, and he did this, and then he did that, and he's pursuing me even now, and oh, what was that noise? That's him knocking at the door or whatever. And so the, their narcissism creates a revision of history as to what has gone on in order to control that audience. So the audience responds saying, sending hugs, stunning and brave, you have my support, etc. Thus they receive the fuel. And all they do is keep propagating misinformation about narcissism and those people watching that channel, they aren't able to differentiate between a genuine victim and a narcissist. Over time, they might be able to do so. So many of my valuable viewers, having immersed themselves in the quality of my information, do come to me and send a video and they say, HG, I think this person is a narcissist. Do you agree um, it might make a worthwhile video, etc." And so there are, of course, videos out there which show a genuine situation between a narcissist and a victim, and it's been posted by the victim as part of their seeking to warn others, etc. But you also have channels that are run by individuals who believe that they're helping other people. And of course, mid-range narcissists ostensibly believe that they're kind, pleasant, empathic people, and that they're the victim of this awful individual. Because when that victim escaped them, their narcissism tells them, that person, you did everything for them, and they cheated on you, and they left you, and they've been abusing you. So the narcissist wants that fuel. So they go scrambling to create a platform on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram, where they share all of this information. And all you're getting is the warped perspective of an unaware mid-range narcissist. I'm honest about what I am. That's why I use the pseudonym. So it enables me to tell you this is precisely the way that I behave. These are the things that my kind do. And I can tell you all of this because you don't know who I am. So it's not going to impact upon my need for control. I can relay all of this information because it actually offends my need for control to see all of this crap information that's out there pumped out by people who don't know what they're talking about. And I want that corrected. So it's part of negating that threat to control posed by the misinformation that's part of the reason why I do what I do. And I can be straightforward about it and direct and blunt as to that's what we are, that's why we behave. No, that is incorrect. No, that doesn't happen. No, that's an exaggeration and to set straight. And unfortunately, there's a lot of this nonsense permeating the internet and it really needs to be dealt with. So that's quite understandably why I explain to people you need to choose your sources very carefully when it comes to understanding about narcissism. And naturally, if you use my material, you're not going to go wrong. I'd also just like to take a moment and comment on the fact that you have started, uh, I'm not sure I would call it a series, but you have been mm -hmm. sharing a lot of videos and I'm actually curious where you get the, the content from, um, but that's just complete curiosity. But you've been sharing a lot of content, uh, material that you have videos of in, victim interacting with the narcissist where you're actually able to break it down and show what the behavior is so people can see a live demonstration of well it's not live but a video recorded uh, demonstration mm -hmm. of it and an interplay between them it's yes. very very fascinating i highly recommend it if anybody has not seen these videos it is i mean i think second to your gabby petito series which 
and maybe also the Tinder, uh, Tinder swindler, because that was also so mm -hmm. informative and so uh, illuminating to understand the, the uh, dynamic between the victim and the narcissist. But to have the ability to see it like that and have somebody break it down is so incredible. And is this um, material that is actually submitted to you from the victims where they want to get your professional assessment? Where are you coming across this material from? Oh, Faye, I make mention to my valuable viewers that if there's a topic they'd like me to cover, then they can email me and suggest topics, and many, many people do. So they might send me a news article showing something that's gone on where they think, I believe that's a narcissist that might make a useful example for you to talk about, HG. Naturally, some of the material I find myself. And when it comes to the videos, again, some people send them in, and I have one particular um, viewer and reader of my work who has sort of made it a bit of a side mission for herself to hunt down these videos from uh, the internet and then offer them to me to say, I think this is a good example. And this person, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, has a very good understanding of my work. So she's particularly adept at finding examples of, let's say, a lower mid ranger in action, or here's some examples of Hoover's. So having understood my work, <clears throat> she is then able to go and look on the internet and go, aha, not only do I recognize that's likely to be a narcissist, but it shows this facet of the dynamic. So she's very useful in that regard and sends that to me saying, I think it shows this HG. Um, do you agree? So naturally it goes through my assessment as to whether it cuts the mustard as an example. So that's where, so the series is watch the narcissist in action. And a number of the videos that appear in that have come via her seeking out these excellent examples. So um, other people do contribute, but the bulk of them have come from that particular individual. And it's she's able to sniff out these videos because she understands my work so well. She's a, so she's an absolute uh, star in that respect and providing that material. And then I can use it because I don't really have the time to go around looking for this. I am reliant upon people offering recommendations. Of course, I read a number of newspapers. I take my news from lots of different sources. So I will come across articles myself and I think oh, that's a good example of a narcissist. So I'll, I'll use that. But I also encourage people to send me articles and videos of it in action so that I can then use that or of course the person has put it out there on the internet to begin with. So it's not like you're showing something that's private. They've already put it out there. The only thing that I don't want people to send me is videos created by other people about the topic. I haven't got the time or the interest. So if you've got, if you like the live raw footage of uh, an interaction between two people, which you think is narcissist versus victim, so a couple that are having a, a series of arguments, that's fine. What I don't want is, this often happens in relation to this one's wife, is people send me another commentator about this one's wife's work saying, HG, this person's talked about this. What do you think? And I haven't got time to sit through that person's video. I'm not interested. But if you find some raw footage on the internet that you think demonstrates an interaction between narcissist and victim, maybe even between narcissist and narcissist, then send the video to me and I'll take a look. And uh, I always welcome that new material. So first and foremost, a big thank you to this uh, wonderful viewer that you have that's submitting all of this fantastic material to you. Mm -hmm. you she's a national treasure, um, second only to you, of course, but um, that she's uh, finding uh, all uh, of this uh, and giving it to you is so helpful for people to actually see it. Really, it's very informative. Um, I'm curious, because we are, we have touched upon this one's wife, and for anyone who's not familiar, this is what, um, this is who HG uh, affectionately or not affectionately refers to uh, Meghan Markle. Um, so he'll either call her Harry's wife or this one's wife because of um, a comment she had made at a speech where she had mentioned being a wife to this one. So I love that you, you've you just taken that and you've run with it. 
But do you think you will ever tire of speaking with her, uh, uh, speaking about her? Because <laughs> the the material is, oh God, it's it's hysterical and it's so funny. And I think we really get to see so much of your personality come through and shine when you're talking about her because it's such a obvious disdain that you have, but it's also, it's just funny and informative. But do you think you'll ever actually tire of speaking about her or is she the gift that just keeps on giving for you? I liken her in a sense to when you're a band that's been going 30, 35 years and you've got a hit from all those years ago that you're sick of playing, but the fans love. So she's actually quite a tiresome subject because she's boring. She is. She's a boring individual, apart from she's a fantastic example of narcissism in action. And because one, she needs to keep telling us that she's there. Therefore, she does these PR puff pieces. She does the pap walks, etc. And the media knows that there's a lot of people who can't stand her, who get all worked up whenever anything is written about her and comment about it and click on it. So they know that it's good for the revenue. She isn't going away anytime soon because of those two factors, which means it provides me with a wealth of material to examine and there's an audience for it. And it would be remiss of me not to use her as an example. And naturally, I get the occasional pleb that comes along and goes, oh, OG, you're obsessed with her. I'm not actually, not. But given the fact that there's such an appetite for information about her and her behaviour, and there's so much material, then I may as well use it. So I do. I give the audience what it wants. That's the, that's the first law of creating material which educates and entertains, give people what they want. People want to hear about her. Now, there are others who say, oh, I'm sick of her. Well, the good news is I have thousands of other videos which are nothing to do with her. So everybody's kept happy. If you want to know about this one's wife, there's lots of videos about her. If you don't, there's lots of videos which aren't about her. And when I first started talking about her, I was relatively neutral in the things that I would say and kept it more to the analysis of narcissism. I still do the analysis of her narcissism, but in order to make it interesting for me, I allow my disdain to appear as well, hence the entertaining and amusing comments, etc., that I from time to time engage in as a way for dealing with this Duchess of Industrial Beige. So she certainly serves a purpose because there are plenty of people who've come to me who've said, HG, I've booked an art detector or I've booked an audio consultation with you because I first came across you as a consequence of Harry's wife or this one's wife. And it made me realize actually that I think I'm in a relationship with a narcissist. Well, that's precisely the, that is one of the biggest purposes of that vehicle. It is to reach an audience that I might not otherwise have reached to help them understand about narcissism. And that's why I do the videos about various famous and infamous people, because someone will go, oh yeah, I've always wondered what's wrong with him or her, or I've always thought there's something a bit off about that individual. So the celebrity breakdowns and the famous people breakdowns, the political breakdowns, et cetera, that I do, putting people under the Tudor scope, as I call it, that's why it interests people. And of course, I also use the examples of uh, individuals who aren't well known, who perhaps get a bit of prominence on a local or national news. So there was one yesterday called um, Brick to the Head, Narcissist in Action where that was just a citizen, so to speak. But it provided you with another example of an artist, nobody famous, nobody well known, but an excellent example. And those are brilliant teaching aids because all the various concepts that I talk about, people get to them, but there is nothing that drives it home as well as seeing it in action and going, ah, right, so that's triangulation. Or, oh, so that's what heated ignited fury looks like. If you can see a visual representation of it on your screen, as I'm telling you, that's what it is. It really does sink in for people. So that's why I create those uh, videos utilizing existing material or articles, because it really drives it home that this is not an academic subject. This is what is actually happening to people. 
So I have one more question that I want to ask about that, and then I want to uh, switch gears and go back to um, empaths. But I'm kind of curious from your perspective, being the ultra and being from the elevated vantage point and understanding your kind so well, um, when you are putting uh, celebrities or famous people under the Tudor scope, when you're ascertaining or establishing their level of a narcissist, what is that experience like for you? Do you, do you care? Do you feel anything if they're a lower, lesser? Like, what's the experience like for you when you are analyzing them? It is an intellectual exercise of going to the evidence, which is taken from a variety of different sources, video interviews, uh, written interviews, uh, puff pieces, historical pieces, uh, journalistic articles, whatever it might be. So I take that information from a wide range of sources and strip out the relative examples which go one way or another with regards to making the determination as to what that person is. So it's a wholly forensic exercise. And the emphasis, of course, is upon utilizing an example which is teaching people things so that they understand and learn from it. That's the aim of it. What do I think about those individuals? I don't really have a view about them. They ask a uh, ask a scientist what does he think about the microbes that he's looking at. He doesn't. They're just a means to an end. It's similar with the people that I analyze under my Tudor scope. They are just there to enable me to reach my aim, which is educating people and extending my legacy. So I don't think to myself, Christ, he's an odious individual, isn't he? Or oh, what an absolute sweetie she is. None of those thoughts go through my head. It's all geared to what does this mean? What does this show? Does this serve the purpose of making a particular point about an aspect of their personality, which goes towards showing emotional empathy or an absence of thereof, and so on and so forth. So it's a purely forensic exercise. That objectivity, that cold analysis is what makes it so much, uh, is why my work's superior, because I have that detachment. I don't, I don't have favour for that individual, even if it was somebody, for instance, uh, an individual whose work I might regularly watch or uh, engage in, that isn't going to colour my analysis of them. There's no bias included in it because it's about the examination. That's what matters. At the end of the day, I don't care if somebody's work that I read is a psychopath or a narcissist it makes no difference to me. Other people might be affected by that, something that, of course, periodically is an issue for me. There are some people that won't access my work because of what I am. You're allowed to do that. It's your choice. You're missing out. But I fully understand that some people say, no, he's not for me. I can't stomach what he is. Other people say, yeah, would not would never want to meet him, but his work is so effective. I, I don't really care that he he is that. I care about the effectiveness of getting out of this particular situation. Is your cold detachment because of the narcissism or is that the psychopathy? It's a psychopathy. And we have discussed that previously. Again, guys, I'm going to link that video down below if you have not yet seen it. It's rather insightful and I'll just leave it at that. Now, can you speak to, in your experience or your understanding, if empaths are born or made? The, an individual has the capacity to become an empath. So that's contained within them. And they develop their empathy as a consequence of, as they develop as a human being. So... In actual fact, a child, an infant child, starts off more narcissistic than empathic because that child, an, an infant human child, is pathetic. It can't walk, it can't feed itself, it can't hydrate itself, it can't regulate its temperature in terms of reaching for clothing, it can't soothe itself. Therefore, there is a primary caregiver maybe more than one caregiver and that caregiver comes along and offers a breast or a bottle clothes the child 
soothes them, rocks them, whatever it might be, rubs their back to get their wind up, etc. And that child starts off believing that that person only exists for them, that they're almost like an automaton that comes out of a cupboard to attend to their need. And it's only over time that that child develops emotional empathy by recognizing and being taught, but they have to have the capacity to receive it, that there are things such as sharing and cooperation and patience, waiting your turn, etc., politeness and so forth, which become taught to the child. So the child has to have the capacity to have that emotional empathy imbued in them and then be exposed to, in effect, learning it. Now, you have a classification system for narcissists as well as empaths. So can you speak a little bit as to the different classifications that you have for empaths? Yes. So with empaths, I divide them into school and cadre. So the schools are standard, super codependent and contagion. And I've got various works explaining what all of that means. And with the cadres, there's martyr, magnet, carrier, savior, and geezer or gazer. And again, with those cadres, there are various characteristics and behaviors associated with them. And I've got various works which explain that in greater detail. An empath is not made exclusively of one of those categories. So for instance, they might be a majority standard empath with a sliver of codependency and a slice of super. And they might not have any contagion. With regard to their cadre, they might not have a majority. So they may show as being, let's say, very strong with savior, significant in relation to carrier, and insignificant with regard to magnet. So there's these different makeups, and it all means different things. And the empath detector that I offer for people explains, uh, determines are you an empath, and if so, tells you which one, and then gives you a lot of information about what all of that means. I'm also going to recommend if anybody is not familiar with the empath detector, it is a service that HD offers. It's incredibly insightful. In addition to that, he also does have a lot of material on his YouTube channel about the different kinds of schools and cadres of the empaths. Now, I'm also curious um, if in your experience, different kinds of narcissists are attracted to different kinds of empaths. Do they fit together like pieces in a puzzle? Do some attract one another? Do some perhaps even repel one another? What does that look like? Narcissists do have um, favoured types of empath. Of course, <clears throat> if you start off with your sort of menu, as I mentioned at the outset of the conversation, any classification of person can attend to the prime aims. But the preference is empath over normal, over narcissist, over narcissistic. Then certain narcissists are drawn to certain types of empath. So, for instance, a basic example is um, lesser narcissists tend to choose somebody that exhibits Giza behaviours because that means they're more likely to fountain with fuel and it, the lessers are the laziest of the narcissists and therefore they want to be able to squeeze the orange and get the juice out nice and quickly. So, therefore, somebody that fountains with fuel more readily appeals to them. Mid-range narcissists like saviour types because not only are mid-rangers generally more passive aggressive and cowardly and therefore they want somebody that rides into battle on their behalf which a savior empath will do but they can also harness that savior empath to make them look good by causing them to do good works on their behalf so you have different types of narcissist that will want different types of empath based upon those different categorizations. And one of the things that the empath detector tells you is which school of narcissists, which subschool of narcissists rather, is most attracted to you. That doesn't mean you're always going to meet that type of narcissist because 
for instance, there might not be some around you. So for instance, if your outcome is such that the lower greater is attracted to you, well, they're pretty rare. So you might not ever meet one. Therefore, how can one be attracted to you? Or rather, how can one couple with you if there aren't any way in the circles that you move in? So a different type of narcissist will find you tasty. It's just a simple case that certain narcissists find certain empaths tastier than others. That's a great explanation. Thank you for that. And with an unaware narcissist, what was what would that look like for them and how they are attracted to the different kinds of empaths that are available to them? So the narcissism operates in a way where it makes the narcissist, the unaware narcissist, think and feel a particular way in order for them to be attracted to that individual and to be motivated to pursue the prime aims for them. So in a non-narcissist example, when your throat is dry, your body is telling you you're dehydrated, so it makes you feel uncomfortable. You understand what that means, so you go and get a drink. You remaining hydrated is crucial for you remaining alive. If you didn't have the experience of thirst, you would not necessarily be disciplined enough to have a drink every couple of hours, I say, or more frequently, if you were exerting yourself or it was particularly hot, therefore you would risk dehydration resulting in injury or death. Thus, your body has evolved with that self-defense mechanism to drive you to seek hydration to keep you alive. The narcissism operates in a similar way. It causes the narcissist to view the empath in a particular way so that they then respond in, a, in an appropriate way to pursue that individual. So for instance, it will cause that narcissist to look upon that individual favorably, that they'll be infatuated with that individual, that they will see them as the most fragrant, delightful, kind individual, then that appeals to them, or that they see them as a really sexy, intriguing individual, so they're drawn to them. So there's lots of different ways that the narcissism essentially creates a feeling and a thought a mindset in the narcissist to drive them to be attracted to particular individuals who are empaths. And can you also explain what an empath supernova is? An empathic supernova is essentially an instance where an empath who has some super in their empathic makeup reaches a point whereby they go over a threshold so that they, for want of a better description, explode. Doesn't necessarily mean that they go, they are angry. It can be a very controlled, focused energy. And the purpose of it is essentially to cause them to find an escape route in relation to the narcissist. So it's not per se about attacking the narcissist and getting all medieval on their ass. Many people misunderstand and they go, yeah, I'm a Hayoka ninja super uh, empathic supernova empath. It's an event, not a classification. And the event occurs when the narcissist pushes and pushes in a particular way against that individual who has that aspect of super in their categorization so that they explode. And if, if you will, they blast a path which enables them to either escape the narcissist completely or get a path to safety with regard to the situation that they find themselves in. They fight back in a way that isn't about attacking the narcissist. It's actually more defensive than that, but it's, it enables the narcissist. It's almost as if the empath crouches into a ball, channels this energy, and it's like an electromagnetic pulse that goes boom. And the narcissist is temporarily stunned and taken aback so that that empath is then able to move themselves to freedom. I talk about that more in a video and write about it in a blog article as well to help people understand what it is. But many people think that they experience an empathic supernova because, well, it sounds a bit cool. And actually, they don't. Uh, what they invariably, their response is more of what's called a cliff fight back which is where you're backed into a corner. You have no choice but to suddenly go boom. And I've got another video, which is Cliff Fight Back versus Empathic Supernova to help people understand the difference between the two. I'm going to have to check that out. That I, That is definitely a video I have not seen. And I don't know how that's okay. look through the cracks because that sounds fantastic. 
But you said that's only will occur with somebody that has super in their classification. So would that yeah. be, you're saying um, that might be an empath that actually gets away on their own and they're not necessarily disengaged from. Correct. So it might be that they find themselves in a particular situation and the empathic supernova allows them to sort of blast back the narcissist so that they escape from that situation, that they reach a particular resolution. In other instances, it's the thing that drives them to escape from the narcissist completely. Interesting. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I am curious, in your experience, how an empath can protect themselves against your kind? The simplest answer to that is access my work. It's about one, as I mentioned earlier, recognize you're dealing with a narcissist, understand what that means, implement no contact and stick to it. Those are the essential planks of how you protect yourself. Moving forward, to avoid getting caught again, you need to ensure that you've lowered your emotional thinking, which means a number of months of staying away from known narcissists. Stay away from the hunting grounds as set out in my book, Sitting Target, so you reduce the risk of you being caught again. And at this point, you will have reduced your emotional thinking to a low level that you see everything in pin sharp crikey vision, that you're able to observe individuals without the distraction of emotional thinking. So in a way, you've sobered up. You also need to have learned what the red flags are, the black flags are, the the early warning detector that I provide in the knowledge vault. So that now, with a clear head and unimpaired vision, you are you know what to look for and you'll pay notice to it as well. So when you're in the ensnarement, the way you protect yourself is know what you're dealing with, then implement your no contact regime and get yourself out, keep yourself out, lower your emotional thinking. Once you've done that and stayed away, make sure that you're not going anywhere where you might get dragged back in by a narcissist whilst your emotional thinking comes down. Learn what are the signs of the narcissist. Look, understand what are the calling signs, the calling cards of the narcissist. And then moving forward, you can implement that knowledge with low emotional thinking so that immediately you'll go, hang on a second, this man I'm dating, something's not right here. I'm seeing lots of red flags, I'm backing off. You spot the red flags and you act on them. Hitherto, you either wouldn't know what to look for, or if you did, you wouldn't pay any attention to them. Now, you understand what you need to look for and you have that clarity of vision. So can you also speak to what the red flags and the black flags are? Not, not that there's not, not that you yourself haven't spoken about it, not that we haven't spoken about it. I just feel like they're so important and it bears repeating again. Well, they're covered in two books that I've written, okay? Red Flag and Black Flag. So there's a lot of detail in there. Examples of red flags when you're first involved with somebody is excessive compliments, compliments that don't really match your understanding of the situation. So, for instance, you might recognize that, yeah, I'm okay looking, but I'm not a supermodel. And somebody keeps referencing the fact that you're the most beautiful woman on earth, you're the most handsomest man that they've ever witnessed. It doesn't quite sit right. Somebody who wants to spend a lot of time with you from the very off. Someone that wants to spend a lot of time with you where they're causing you to sacrifice existing commitments that you've had. So let's say you would go to chess club once a week. They start badgering you for you not to go. And that's a, a, a red flag. An individual who badmouths their exes a lot. An individual who is buying you gifts repeatedly, but it's not your birthday and it's not Christmas. They don't know you. Why are they doing that? Well, in effect, they're grooming you. Many people, of course, look at it and think, oh, they're just being nice. Everybody likes to receive a gift. But this person's only just met you. And there's no special occasions that they ought to be sharing with you. So again, that's a red flag. Um, other red flags are, for instance, an individual where they're rather vague about things that you've asked about them, that they can't really give you any detail. That's odd that they're either being evasive or what you're asking them about, they've perhaps told you a lie and therefore they've given you a superficial answer and there's no depth to it. Hence, they have to be evasive through vagueness. So one needs to watch out for that. Um, sudden flarings of temper that might come out of nowhere. 
you might be dealing with a less evolved narcissist. That's something to look for. An individual that doesn't talk well about their family, that also is a red flag. Uh, an individual who allows you to pay for everything or wants to pay for everything, those are red flags. Remember, someone might exhibit one or two red flags. That doesn't mean they're a narcissist. So you might go on a date with somebody who opens the car door for you, is always asking you if you're all right, uh, always allows you to go through the door first, is opening those doors for you, is excessively polite. That's a red flag. But if you don't see any other, you're just dealing with somebody who's excessively polite and they're not a narcissist. So you've got to remember, you need to see quite a number of these red flags. And also, if, if you see this person sort of two or three times, are they popping up these red flags or different red flags on these occasions that you're seeing them? Because everybody can have a bad day where they might actually exhibit certain behaviours which you think, oh, yeah. So you can't make a determination just off one interaction that you're dealing with a narcissist. You need to look for, are there a number of red flags and am I seeing them the regularity? So an individual who wanted to spend all day with you on Sunday, but lets you get on with your life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then sees you on Friday, that's not somebody monopolizing your time. But someone who's speaking to you every evening for three or four hours on the telephone, fun as it might be, they're monopolizing your time. There's a red flag. How much do you feel like boundaries also come into play in the exchange between an empath and a narcissist? Is it that the empath is not perhaps enforcing boundaries or is not recognizing that their boundaries may in fact be trampled? Um, and what are some things they can do to fortify their own personal boundaries? Because I feel like, you know, one of the things you were just saying is where the narcissist is monopolizing your time, maybe spending hours on the phone with you, that's kind of like a, a lack of boundary recognition. Mm -hmm, that's right. Narcissists don't have boundary recognition. And empaths are notoriously rubbish at enforcing boundaries. Thus, <clears throat> narcissists will trample all over them. So the point is, it's, it is pointless trying to enforce a boundary with the narcissist because the narcissist won't recognize it. The only boundary you should enforce is no contact. So saying to a narcissist, I'm not going to talk to you tonight, will result in that narcissist being, uh, their control is threatened. Now, if you're in the golden period, the narcissist might do sufficient that they, what they won't do is just go, oh, all right then, but go, I'll go on. I, I, I need to talk to you tonight. There's something I need to speak, say to you. Or, well, I really miss you if I don't speak to you. And you think, we've only been seeing each other two weeks. How can you really miss me? But the point is that the narcissist won't accept what you say. They'll push. They'll push to talk to you that evening. Uh, they might make you feel a bit guilty. Oh, I'm feeling a bit low, actually. So I really needed to talk to you tonight. So that impacts upon, uh, that's a manipulation through guilt. So the, the difficulty you've got is, that when you try and enforce a boundary with the narcissist, the narcissist won't accept it. So it's rather pointless to try and do so. Also, of course, when you try and enforce a boundary with the narcissist, what are you doing? You're continuing to have an interaction with them, which if you're at the point of no contact, that's a breach. So with what empaths are better working on is the enforcement of boundaries with non-narcissists, because some, some empaths rather, not all, tend to be a bit of a pushover and dealing with non-narcissists as well and where they can actually get some uh, improvement is learning about the enforcement of boundaries with non-narcissists because of course non-narcissists can also take advantage of people because they'll have an intrinsic selfishness about them even though they're not narcissists themselves so the point is don't bother trying to enforce boundaries with narcissists the only one that you should impose is no contact and then for the rest of the time, if you want to do some work in relation to boundaries, then that's fine. You can do so in relation to non-narcissists and that will actually improve aspects of your life. Thank you for that explanation. And do you feel there's a certain amount of time that a uh, empath should or could date somebody before they're going to have an adequate representation if they're in fact dating a narcissist? Or sometimes if you just know, it could be, you could be two weeks in, you just know, you go so. 
or are there certain maybe like time periods they could stay to get a greater understanding of who they're dealing with? There's no set time period because if uh, one was to say you need a minimum of five dates, you could actually find plenty of red flags by date two, and then you're putting yourself in danger um, by going on the third, the fourth, the fifth date, not in terms of being attacked, but rather in danger that your emotional thinking rises so high that the window of opportunity for you to evade this individual slams shut and you're drawn in. So the point is, one wouldn't say that there's a set period of time that you would look to. It's about, you You might see lots of red flags on a first date. That can happen. And then you think, right, I'm going to run a mile. Sometimes it might be the fourth or fifth date before they start to come out, at which point you then run a mile. So there's no set time period. And would you strongly discourage people from starting an intimate relationship too soon for those reasons as well because that can definitely increase your emotional thinking absolutely the it is common of course when the narcissist has mauled you and disengaged you and left you sprawled in the dirt and you're upset to think well the best way of getting over somebody is to get under somebody new but of course that you're highly at risk of walking into the arms of another narcissist reason for this you're an empathic individual which means you're susceptible to narcissists to narcissists want to be with you because you're an empathic target so they'll sniff you out so to speak thirdly the height of your emotional empathy is such because you've just been in a relationship with a narcissist it'll be very high so you're not you're not seeing clearly so it means when that narcissist does come along you are unlikely to pick up on them being a narcissist even though you've been reading about narcissism and i've seen it happen with many people who have not done as i've told them to do and they've gone into a relationship fairly soon after the demise of the one with the relationship, only for them to come back months later and go, I should have listened to you, HG, you were right. Well, experience uh, creates a cost for them, but at least they've realized the second time, perhaps then they will listen and implement what they need to do. When your relationship has ended with the narcissist, whether you escaped or whether you were disengaged from, you need roughly a six month period of, of staying away from dating so that you don't run the risk of meeting somebody else who might be a narcissist and reducing your emotional thinking. Of course, people, their emotional thinking tells them, oh, you know, get out there and find somebody who will take your mind off the guy that you've just, where the relationship's gone wrong. It will take your mind off the woman that um, you, you were lamenting the loss of. Yeah, but you're very vulnerable and at risk of walking into the arms of another narcissist. So don't do it. That is probably the best advice. Seriously. Uh, I think that's the best advice anybody can receive and implement into their life when ending a relationship, whether it's with a narcissist or a non-narcissist. Give yourself a lot of breathing room. Mm. Now, there's a, something I actually neglected to ask you earlier on, so I do just want to backtrack on that. And I'm kind of curious because you are a self-aware narcissist. So when you're in a relationship with somebody <laughs> does that tend to look the same as it would for other narcissists because you have that level of awareness so are you going to have a disengagement period as well are, are is are, is there going to be a devaluation period or can you temper or change the way you are in a relationship because you have that level of awareness there will always be a devaluation um, disengagement may occur if one of the triggers occurs but the peculiarity of it is that when a new relationship starts we're imbued with the expectation that this time it's going to work that this person is different from all the rest and of course when it goes wrong it's because of their failings not because of mine so then because i tire of them they enter devaluation so People often ask, well, given that you know what you are, surely you can stop yourself. Well, no, I don't want to stop myself. I enjoy doing what I do. It's my peculiarity of that form of enjoyment. So when I first meet this person, I don't set out thinking, I'm going to make this person's life hell at the outset. I think this is an interesting, desirable person. 
let's see where it goes to. But invariably, they'll do something that lets me down and thus the devaluation occurs. That's the, that's the nature of the dynamic. And I might te temper, for example, the forms of manipulation that are utilized. But of course, the manipulations still remain. The games have to be played. That's the nature of the dynamic that I have with people, whether it's romantic or otherwise. Thank you for that honest answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, I'm curious if there's anything else that you would like to share with my audience. Is there anything else I would like to share? One thing that's important for people to recognize is whilst understanding is very important, don't get caught up on it if it's not making sense for you. I say this because what can commonly happen is that people become self-defeating by trying to understand when they're not ready to understand. For some people, all you need to know is this. You're involved with a narcissist get out and stay away from them. Yeah, but what did it mean when he did this? Forget that, you're dealing with a narcissist. It's a little bit like your house is on fire, you need to get out now. Yeah, but how did the fire start? I need to go and look and see why it started. Your house is on fire, get out. Yeah, but I'll just go and get this personal possession. No, your house is on fire, get out. Where will the fire move to next? I need to go and see. No, you don't, your house is on fire, get out. So. What can happen is, because your emotional thinking is so high, you think to yourself, I need to understand what's happened to me. On the face of it, that seems entirely logical, Faye. That's, it makes sense. But because your emotional thinking is so high, you're not going to be able to understand it. It's not because you're stupid or dumb. It's because your emotional thinking doesn't want you to understand. Because if you understand, you'll stop feeding your addiction. So your emotional thinking wants to cloud your thoughts in effect. So you think, I've read about narcissism, but I still don't understand what it meant when he did this. So I'm going to talk to my friends about it, and I'm going to think about it. Well, what are you doing? You're entering arenas of interaction. You're keeping your emotional thinking high. So guess what? You don't understand it. And rather than go, ah, the reason I don't understand is because I'm keeping my emotional thinking high. You go, no, I still don't get it. So I need to talk about it some more and think about it some more, and then I'll be able to understand it. And therefore, what then happens, you keep your emotional thinking high and you then get stuck on the narcissist wheel of misery, whereby in trying to understand what's happened, you actually are preventing yourself from understanding. Some people, their emotional thinking has dropped down, so they create room in their head for the logic to permeate, and they're able to understand. But for other people, they're not at that stage yet. And sometimes all that they're capable of understanding and accepting is this. This is a narcissist. Get away from them. Stay away from them. You can work out what it all meant later on. In the same way, you can speak to the fire department about why the fire started, and all that other stuff later. The important thing is remove yourself because if you remove yourself and you stay away, your emotional thinking will come down and then you can revisit these questions and it'll start to make sense. So if you find yourself at that stage of, I'm reading about it, but it, it still doesn't make any sense to me. I'm, I'm not grasping it. Stop trying to understand. Just get on with your no contact regime and revisit those questions later. Thank you for that. And as you mm -hmm. were talking, another uh, question came up, which is, what would you say to somebody that has perhaps shared their, they acknowledge there's narcissists in their life, but they feel like they keep getting hoovered back in? What could somebody in that situation do? Well, they need to look at why they haven't put in place a no contact regime and they need to analyze what regime and they put in place and see the weaknesses in it. So the best thing they could do is speak to me and I could give them their ob objective analysis and say, here's where you're going wrong. This is what you need. So it's a little bit like um, coming along and saying, there are these problems with my house. Can you survey it and tell me what the problems are? So then I know what I need to do. 
so often it's helpful to get a third party who understands the subject, i.e. me, to analyze what you've been doing and to tell you where you've been going wrong and then tell you what you need to do to correct it so that you're not going to get hoovered any longer. Hmm. Can you share with us what it's like being an what it is like being the ultra? Marvelous. <laughs> The ability to know oneself and to sit in the rarefied stratosphere, looking down on everything else, being able to see the patterns in people's behaviours, to be able to anticipate what they're going to do next, to be able to play the games. It's all entertaining and keeps the boredom at bay. I don't experience sadness. I don't experience loneliness. I am an effective individual. So having that level of knowledge and the abilities which enables me to go to some very play, very interesting places, do some extremely interesting things, much of which I can't talk about, then it's great to be me, quite simply. So you said you don't experience sadness or loneliness. Do you experience happiness? No. So would you say that your temperament is more even, more balanced? Yes, it is. Naturally, there'll be occasions where fury tries to make its presence felt. But for the most part, uh, you would see me as a composed individual. So you won't see me drop into the floor sobbing. That just will never, ever happen and never has happened. I don't sit on my own going, oh, oh, oh I wish I knew more people. That doesn't happen. I don't run around elated. Some narcissists do portray happiness and elation although they're not really experiencing it it's the receipt of fuel um but i'm not an individual that's given to outpourings of emotion even where it's manufactured that's not the way that i function do people have the capacity to surprise you i've seen a lot i've done a lot i've experienced a lot but one of the things that I stand by is there is always something to be learned. So I wouldn't say I would necessarily be surprised, but there are many things yet that I have not uncovered or experienced that I may well do so. There are other worlds, so to speak, to look into. I don't think, I don't really respond with surprise because I have experienced a lot of circumstances uh, and events, so much of it is a repetition of something that I've seen before. But also, it's not within me to react in a surprised way either. I evaluate and assess and absorb what's going on. And often, there's a, an inkling of that was going to be the case. So... I'm not somebody that's given to being surprised, but I recognize there's still plenty to learn. I think the other way of asking that, which is, are people predictable to you? Because yes. you're such a good uh, an analyzer of character. I can't imagine that there's a lot of room for you to actually be surprised by people. So you were saying people are rather predictable to you. They are. And of course, that is something that I rely upon, the predictability of people's responses, because one caters for that in what I do. Does that make interacting with people boring? With many people, yes. However, there are lots of people also who are intellectually stimulating because they lead interesting lives, they have interesting things to say, they have interesting viewpoints, and those are the people that I like to engage with. So I don't find everybody boring. For instance, I've got friends from um, when I was a child who are still my friends. Granted, I don't interact with them every single day, but I remain friends with them because they serve a purpose to me. But also, I find them interesting individuals. So when we meet up, they've got interesting things to tell me about, what they've been doing lately, where they've been to. They'll have interesting viewpoints on the world. And it's that intellectual stimulation that's very important to me. That answered the next question, which is, do you have friends? You just answered that. I do. Um, of course, they're non-intimate secondary sources in my fuel matrix. 
but I would refer to them as my friends. Because if I was going around saying, I'm off to see my non-intimate secondary sources to somebody, they go, what the hell, what the hell is he talking about? What an odd bod. So, yeah. And uh, that intellectual curiosity is very important to me. Naturally, for instance, in my intimate partners, I like physically attractive women. But it is important, very important for them to have something about them, to have a brain. I was only reading this morning over breakfast that Sharon Stone has a t-shirt which says that uh, brains are the new tits and i think perhaps it would scan better if she wrote brains are the new boobs but the the fact is she's right in that that having somebody that's got something about them a curiosity for the world an appetite for information one of the things which i find very tedious is where people just stay within a narrow path that they're not open to discussion, to debate, to that. And many people, oh, I am, but they're not. Because most people are creatures of habit. And also, the world is losing its ability to critically assess information because people are becoming intellectually lazier. We are heading towards the idiocracy, as prophesized in the film of that name. But that's a topic for another day. It sounds like you're, you identify as a sapiosexual, where a mental stimulation is incredibly important to you. It is, but also I enjoy the act of sex in the sense of it provides me with fuel. I have nerve endings like anybody else, and I'm a rather sexual being. But so I can, for want of a better description, bang the brains out of somebody, and they didn't, and they don't, you know, I'm not expecting them to start talking about the works of Shakespeare whilst we're making the beast with two backs. However, if there's going to be any degree of longevity in that relationship, if that individual doesn't have much to say for themselves, it's, you know, a one night stand and that's it. Because thereafter, I would just be tempted to chop their head off because I find them so boring. So there has to be that intellectual stimulation that goes with it. I like interesting people because that provides me with character trait acquisition. Not only does it keep boredom at bay, but it enables me to learn from people, which then makes me all the more effective. I can't do everything. So what I can is I can do much more through other people by hearing about their experience. So, for instance, I have a friend who works in the defence industry in, the, in one particular country. The information I get from him is very useful in terms of what I do professionally, but it was also interesting of itself. I have another friend who's a restaurateur. His experiences and the people that he deals with are interesting anecdotes to listen to and provide me with the basis of information that I can use. So I have different social groups that provide me with interesting things. I don't have cardboard cut out people in my life because they're not catering to the prime aims and they're boring. Mm. You um, are incredibly prolific with the content that you produce. And we've, we've, we've actually discussed this in the past. I'm also curious, in, because you do a fair number of interviews, what yeah. it's like when you're interacting with people and if there's any level of tedium, because I feel like you probably get asked a lot of the same questions on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis. So what that's mm -hmm. like for you to be constantly either asked the same questions or to be sharing the same information over and over again? It is tedious, however, one recognizes that one might be reaching a section of an audience that's never come across my work before, and therefore the basics need to be explained. I've done enough of those interviews, really, that people should be able to find that information for themselves. And what appeals to me now is interviews which discuss topics which perhaps I haven't touched on before. Uh, naturally, talking about myself is always something that I'm content to do because it's me. Um, and there are instances where I get asked very similar questions and it is dull for me. But as I mentioned, I recognize that in those instances, it's about the facade management. So rather than express my disapproval of, oh, I've been asked that again, more is to be gained by answering it and providing people with that insight. And then, of course, note is made with that particular interviewer if they come knocking for a further interview in the, in the future, I may be more likely to decline because I didn't find it a stimulating appearance with them. So the fact that we're on our third interview should tell you something. 
Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I'm curious. So first and foremost, I just want to say congratulations on reaching over 100 million views at this point. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable and that's incredible. That is a huge testament to the quality and the importance of the work that you're producing. But that also kind of led me to question, having reached over 100 million views, has nobody in your personal life known or connected you to HG? No. The reason being is that I am able to keep those worlds separate and the chances of many of them coming across, although I'm well known within the world of narcissism, I'm not well known within the world as H.G. Tudor. So most people have heard of David Beckham, for instance. He's been around a number of decades. He's an internationally well-known footballer and married a Spice Girl. So people know about him. I'm known within the world of narcissism. I'm one of the heavyweights within that arena. But outside of that, I'm not known. And therefore, most of the people in my world aren't going to be looking at information about narcissism. Hence, they're not going to come across H.G. Tudor. There may well have been former intimate partners of mine who have perhaps realised what they were subjected to and have gone looking around and have come across it. I'm confident, however, that that's not going to pose a problem for me because, first of all, they'll have a degree of dissonance where they'll think, no, that can't be him. That they can't think that, let's say, for instance, I'm called John. I'm not, but let's run with that. They wouldn't think to themselves, is that John with a YouTube channel? It just wouldn't stack up for them because what they would know me for doesn't sit at all with running a YouTube channel. So there'd almost be this, no, that can't be him. Secondly, if they did think that it was me, they would know better than to act upon that information. Mm. So the prospects of people marrying the two up are very slim indeed. And where it might have occurred, those that may have put two and two together, they're not stupid enough to do anything about it. Do your siblings know that you have this, that you are HG? No. Wow, so you really kept your personal life separate. Yeah, well, I don't live with my siblings. I just see them from time to time. So it's not like they're going to know that I do all of this. That is remarkable. It's not like I have HG Tudor books lying around. Oh, even if I did, they might go, who's that? And I go, oh, this is a brilliant author. You might want to read him. <laughs> HG, as always, it is a pleasure to speak with you. I really enjoy hearing your perspective. You are a wealth of information. I really cannot uh, emphasize enough the importance of your work to people. And for anybody that is watching this, um, please check out HG's work. I'm going to be linking all of his information down below. Do yourself a favor. Get yourself a birthday present. Book a consultation with HG it will be life-changing for you. Thank you for that endorsement, Faye. You're, you're, you're incredible. I mean, you're just such a wealth of information. And every time we speak, I feel like I get so much more out of these conversations and out of these discourses. And thank you for being so incredibly kind and gracious with sharing your time with me and with my audience. And um, I would love to speak with you again because I, yes, seriously, every time we talk, I feel like I get something new out of this. And I'm just so curious about everything that you have to share. So thank you again for being so gracious with your time. Not a problem. And seriously, guys, check out. I'm going to link um, all of HG's information down below. Please check him out. Do yourself a favor. Subscribe to his channel if you are not already subscribed. And I look forward to speaking with you again, HG. Likewise. Thank you, Faye. Thank you.